I'm going to talk about money and banking and uh, what it is. And um, Henry Ford said rather famously, it is well that the people don't understand money and banking because if they did, there would probably be a revolution before morning. Well, oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, th we're starting to understand, and this is the beginning of the revolution, the banking revolution. Uh, what he meant was that uh, money is not created by the government, as most people think. Most people think that the government issues the money. The only money that government issues are coins, which is one ten thousandth or less of the money supply. All of the rest is created by banks. They create it in the form of loans. That includes dollar bills, which are created by the Federal Reserve, but the Federal Reserve itself, of course, is a bank. And it doesn't just shower the dollars on the people or hand them over to the government. It lends them into the system. So all money comes into the system, except for coins, as a debt. And it comes as a debt bearing interest. So the interest is the problem, that banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest. And because they create virtually all of our money, somebody somewhere has to take out another loan to get the interest. So it's basically a pyramid scheme, and it's mathematically unsustainable. That doesn't necessarily mean the interest is bad, but you need a mechanism to get the interest back into the system. And you could have such a mechanism if, you, if banks were publicly owned. And we had that model back in, um, in colonial times with the Bank of Pennsylvania, which was Benjamin Franklin's colony. And he wrote about this bank and wrote about how well it worked and how well the whole system worked in Pennsylvania. Um, the bank would create, they, they just, those were the days when they printed paper script and that's what the money was. So the government owned the bank. The government would uh, print out, let's say, 100 pieces of this paper script and lend it to the farmers at 5% interest. And then they could print another five and spend it on the, on the budget, the government budget. So then you would have 105 of this paper script out there so you'd have enough money to come back and pay principal and interest. So then you could lend the hundred all over again, spend the five all over again, it would all come back as principal and interest. So it was a totally sustainable system. During the time that they had that system, uh, the government paid, or the, the people paid no taxes except for uh, excise tax on liquor, which was minor. Um, the government had no debt at all and um, prices did not inflate, so it was actually quite sustainable. Uh, today, we have one, one state-owned bank. That's uh, the Bank of North Dakota, which is in North Dakota, obviously. Uh, North Dakota is the only state that escaped the credit crisis completely. In fact, they had a budget surplus every year since 2008. Um, they have the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on loans, the most local banks per capita. Um, some people, oh, and they, they return, the bank returns uh, a hefty dividend to the state every year. They had a 19% return on equity last year, which is huge. Compa I mean, compare that to CalPERS and CalSTRS, which lost 25% and 30% the two years after 2008. Um, some people say that North Dakota is doing well because they have oil, but other states also have oil. That you, it's one thing to have resources in the ground, but you need the infrastructure to pull them out of the ground and get them to the market. And that is what the Bank of North Dakota funded. If you have your own bank, you also have an, um, the possibility of interest-free loans for public infrastructure. Studies have shown that um, public uh, about, on average, 50% of the cost of public projects is the interest. So if you cut out the interest because you own the, own the bank and you get the interest back, um, you, could, you could make many things sustainable that now appear too expensive. For example, green energy or low-cost housing or tra public transportation. All those things can become very cheap if you take out interest. 
Margaret Kennedy was a research, is a researcher in Germany, and she has looked at interest extensively. And she said that 40% of everything we buy is interest. You don't, you don't really notice that. I mean, you might see this, the sales tax, but you don't see the interest on the bill. But at every stage of production, all those producers um, take it, they borrow. They need to borrow to pay their workers and materials before they have a product to sell. So if you add all that up, that's like almost half the cost of everything is interest. That is a, a tribute that is going to what's called the financial services industry, which supposedly is a large portion of GDP, but obviously their financial products don't add anything to real GDP. They don't make products. They take money off the top of the system. And if we own the banks, we could cut out the middlemen and have very cheap interest or very cheap credit for public needs. We could get back, um, take back the state's money, put it in the state's own bank, and leverage it locally for local purposes instead of giving that power away to Wall Street, which is leveraging it against us largely. Like they're buying, they're driving up the price of commodities, they're speculating, they buy companies that, uh, like foreign com companies that are competing with our companies. So we could bring all that back, use it to um, get credit back in the state. That's one, the, the two things that businesses are complaining about is one, they don't have, can't get credit anymore. Their credit lines are being cut even though their business hasn't changed. And without credit, they can't pay for their workers. So, so then they can't hire people. And the other thing is they don't have customers. Well, that means you mean, need more demand. So. We're short of money in the system right now. Uh, we're actually $3 trillion short, according to the Federal Reserve, compared to the amount of money that was in the money supply in 2008. It, that, sorry? Well, no, it's, it's actually, it's the shadow banking system, which is too complicated to go into. But anyway, the money supply has actually shrunk. So we need to get more money out there. Uh, what the Federal Reserve, the Federal, only the Federal Reserve has the power to just create money on their books. And so they, they could actually, they could rescue the students, for example. This whole idea of a student debt jubilee, that is quite possible. There is one trillion dollars in student debt out there now. It's the next debt crisis. And it's just like the sub subprime loans. Students can't get jobs. If they can't get jobs, they can't pay back their loans. So these debts are going to go into default, and a lot of them have already gone into default. So what the Fed could do about it, um, for quantitative easing one, what the Fed d did was to, to print up, basically, or create on their books $1.3 trillion and buy up the toxic assets off the books of the banks. And this was supposedly to free up credit, although it didn't work very well. But what they so, and now they're talking about another round of quantitative easing, and they're saying it will be asset-backed securities. Well, student debt is bundled up into securities and sold off to investors. They are asset-backed securities. So what the Fed could do if it wanted to do, wanted to, is to buy up a trillion dollars in asset-backed securities and, um, and use that money, or sorry, they could buy up the, the student debt, trillion dollars in student debt, and just rip it up if they wanted to. Or more likely, I think what they would probably do is buy up the debt and they could refinance it interest-free. That would cut the cost in half. It would make t uh, tuition once again affordable or free. It should be free, actually. Um, so that's, that's one way that we could, could have a real student debt jubilee, and I think Occupy Wall Street, even though I know you don't want to have specific demands, I think that's one thing that should be brought up, that the Fed has the power, only the Fed has the power, to uh, g have, give a debt jubilee, and this would actually be a very stimulative thing for the economy. Students are the people who spend money. It's not bankers. Bankers don't, they don't shop. I mean, bankers have what they need. But students, are, the young people, are the people who buy the new homes. They, they have to um, b furnish the new homes. They buy the cars. They buy the electronics. They love to shop in the malls. If you g gave a trillion dollars back to the students, in other words, uh, waived their student debts, 
you, you would hugely stimulate the economy. You'd have some customers back in the stores again, and that would give, th this would not be inflationary because we have a shortage of money in the money supply. And what happens when, you, when people take their money and they go shop with it is that the suppliers then put in more orders to the, to the uh, wholesalers and they hire more people and they make more products. So, so you have goods and services rising along with the money supply. So, th so prices don't go up. What happens is that you've got the same, you've got more money competing for more goods, so the prices stay the same. So this would stimulate the economy, get things, uh, the wheels of production rolling again, and, um, and obviously it would help the students, and Occupy Wall Street is largely about, it's largely young people who can't get jobs, so that would help a lot. So is, I'm president of the Public Banking Institute. We're, ju we're just basically a collection of volunteers. I mean, we don't make any money off of this. We're just, uh, we think it's a good idea to have state-owned banks back, uh, publicly-owned banks. And we, there are now 14 states that have bills pending of one sort or another uh, for publicly-owned banks, including California, which um, the bill passed both houses of the legislature, but the governor didn't sign it. But this is, we're going to bring a stronger bill now. But so, so it's all kind of complicated, but we do have some flyers and we're going to pass them around if anybody's interested, so. Oh, that was this governor. It was just, yeah, it was just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, it was just recently, yeah. <laughs> uh, initiative is possible. The problem is that people don't understand banking. And so if you went into the grocery store and you said, do you want to sign my petition for a publicly owned bank, they would say, I don't trust government, I don't, I don't, we don't, what do we need more banks for? So we need more education. It's just like Henry Ford said, if the people understood money and banking, there would be a revolution. We need to redo money and banking. We need a, a completely different model, one that works for the people, of the people, by the people, for the people. Thank you.